Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome again to our morning lecture. It's great to be with you this morning. Uh, the topic for this morning is children of Abraham. We're going to be looking at the fact that the three great monotheistic religions, which represent half the population of the planet, or just under half, all see themselves as tied back to Abraham as their ultimate founder, Father Abraham is Father Abraham both to the Jews, to the Christians, and to the Muslims. And so we'll talk about that this morning. Before we get into the details of it, um, I, I, and I should say, by the way, that in two days' time, I will be doing a talk on um, Islam, Introduction to Islam. And so I'm not going to get into a lot of details about the Islamic faith today, but we'll get into a lot more detail when we have an entire lecture about that. But I'll give you a basic introduction to some of the, some of the primary points of Islam today. Um, as I've done before, these are the lectures I will be giving this afternoon. Emily will be doing the Tomb of Tutankhamun, and we expect wonderful things from that. <laughs> What's that? Oh, sorry. Sorry. She's going to have to use that later. If you don't know what that line means, then, then she'll explain it to you. Um, tomorrow morning, I will be doing a talk on Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and British victory or Allied victory in uh, World War I. Um, and in the afternoon, then, we will have the movie, Lawrence of Arabia, with Peter O'Toole, which is a three-and-a-half-plus-hour movie, and so that will be great fun. Um, later on, in, um, I will be doing, again, the next day, Introduction to Islam, I believe, in the afternoon, and then History, Culture, and Conflict in the Middle East, and Emily will also be doing, she's got uh, a number more talks she'll do. We then are going to sort of, especially after our next stop, we've still got a couple of days, and we'll probably be doing movies either in the morning or in the afternoon. I was suggesting Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm not sure what they're going to end up with. Um, but uh, my niece told me that they were coming out with another, uh, a new pirate movie, and it was rated R. Uh, okay, rough crowd. So all three of the great monothe monotheistic religions of the world today see themselves as going back to Father Abraham. He was the world's first great monotheist. In terms of time, he actually predated Akhenaten, the, the Egyptian pharaoh who, uh, who pushed for a monotheistic belief, or at least a henotheistic belief, in Aten. So Abraham is the first great monotheist. God said to him, in return for your obedience, um, I will, and this is a passage from uh, the 12th chapter of Genesis, I should say, if you're not familiar with the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are called a prehistoric prologue. And it, it, it's primarily about four major events in the history of the, it's the creation of the world, the fall, the introduction of sin into the world, uh, the flood with Noah, and the Tower of Babel. Then at the end of chapter 11, we get introduced to Abraham, but we really find out about it more as we start chapter 12. So the first 11 chapters of Genesis, prehistoric prologue, and when we get to chapter 12, it begins to look much more like what we consider a historical approach, a story of families and events. So in the beginning of chapter 12, the Lord has said to Abraham, or Abram as he was first called, his name got changed later, um, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you, God is saying. I will make, and then he gives several promises. If, if Abraham will do that, God says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. These were the promises God made to Abram, who became Abraham, if he would be obedient and follow God where God takes him. This is then restated, in effect, a second time, in the 15th chapter, a beautiful passage, in the highlighted section, God takes Abra tells Abraham to go outside and look up at the stars. And he says, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. A lot of people believe the Old Testament is all about the law. The law didn't come till Moses, almost 500 years later. The original arrangement with Abraham is... Follow me, do what I tell you, and I will bless you. And you will have, and at this point, Abram and Sarai, his wife, whose name later got changed to Sarah, were quite old already. And the idea of them having children was pretty much out of their minds. But God said, I will not only give you children, I will make of you a great nation, more than the stars in the sky. So this was the promise. In obedience, Abram followed God from his original home, which was the letter Ur, 
down in the land of Mesopotamia, we've talked about that, the land between the rivers, one of the very first, earliest human civilizations. Um, it, it, it might have been Mesopotamia, it might have been Egypt, it might have been the Indus River Valley, they were all very close to the same time. Abraham followed God's instructions up to Haran, where Terah, uh, Terah, his father, died, and then down through Canaan, which would later become the Promised Land, into Egypt, and then back again. So this is Abraham following God's instructions. Now, at this point, as we talk about um, Abraham and the three great monotheistic religions, right away we begin to see a point of separation from them. Abraham's wife was Sarah, or Sarai, as I told you she originally was called, her name was changed. They, by the promise of God, were given a son, Isaac. He was not their first child, the first child born to Abraham, but it was the first child born to Sarah. Isaac had two sons, Jacob, who later was renamed Israel, which is where the name of the nation comes from, and then Esau. Esau uh, became the father of the Edomite people. And then from Jacob, he had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel, the Hebrew nation. Now, before Isaac was born, Abraham and Sarah had been promised by God that they would have children, and it was a custom in ancient times, or at least not uncommon, for um, a servant, a handmaiden, to also bear children in the name of the family. And so they got impatient, and so Sarah herself suggested that Abraham lie with Hagar, who was Sarah's handmaiden. Hagar gave birth to a son, actually the first son in this family, whose name was Ishmael. Ishmael became the father of the 12 tribes of Ishmael, and they were the Arabic peoples, others as well. I mean, there's more than just the Arab peoples that are seen as being descended from Ishmael. So you have these two lines, both looking back to Abraham as the father, but one line through uh, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel became the Jewish nation. The other line, through the handmaiden Hagar, to Ishmael and the 12 tribes of the Arabic nations. At one point, uh, Sarah, after she has a son, and he starts growing up, and Ishmael is older, she starts worrying that at some point, Hagar and Ishmael might claim that, that they have a right of inheritance, when in fact, Hagar wasn't married to Abraham, so Sarah, says, get rid of this woman and her son. Abraham at first doesn't want to do it, but God says, don't worry about it, I will take care of them, I will make, and in fact, I will make of Ishmael a great nation. And he did, there were 12, 12 tribes from Ishmael, 12 tribes from Jacob, called Israel. So they send them away, and when we talk about the Islam, much of the symbolism that occurs during the Hajj, the Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca, has to do with Hagar and Ishmael and the events that happened to them after they left the household of Abraham. Now, from the 12 tribes of Israel through the line of Judah, one of the 12 tribes, we come to Jesus eventually. From the 12 tribes of Ishmael, we eventually come to Muhammad. And so you can see how Christianity, Judaism first, because of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes of the Hebrew people, and then Christianity, Jesus, versus the other line, which is through Ishmael, the 12 tribes, the Arab tribes from Ishmael, and ultimately to Muhammad. That's how those all see themselves tracing back to Abraham, all right? Now, one of the ways in which you can see the similarities and also the differences, Islam, as I'm gonna talk about in just a second, um, Muhammad believed that God had given him a corrective both Judaism and Christianity are honored as being people of the book, we'll talk about what that means, in Islam. However, Muhammad said that God told him that both the Jews and the Christians had distorted the message, that God had given them the holy books of the Torah for the Jews, all of the Tanakh, but especially the Torah. Torah can mean either the first five books or it can mean the whole Hebrew Bible, and, and then the Christian Gospels that they had been distorted, and so Muhammad was given the Quran as a corrective. Well, one of the things that they corrected, as Muhammad presented it, was the sacrifice of Isaac, this famous story where God tells Isaac to take, uh, or tells Abraham to take Isaac, your son, your only son whom you love, I always felt like talking about rubbing salt in the wound, and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. 
Um, and so, which later was the place, location traditionally of the city of Jerusalem. Well, the Islamic version of that is that God told Abraham to take Ishmael and sacrifice him. So right there, you begin to see the same root story, but with the difference between Isaac and Ishmael. The two lines through which Judaism and Christianity on one side and Islam on the other side occurred. And then there also is the parts of the story where it was Abraham and Ishmael that ended up going to Mecca and clearing all of the idols of the false gods, because polytheism was very common in, in Arabia in the time of Muhammad. That it, um, he says that initially it was Abraham and Ishmael that came to Mecca, cleared out all those gods, and then the people came along later and reinstated them, and then Muhammad was responsible for once again clearing it out. Now to give you sort of a timeline, we start out with civilization beginning 3200 BC, and again you can use different dates for that. I've, I've used 4500, there's different ways you can calculate that, but basically when civilization as we understand it, that is sedentary life, cities, cultivated crops, domesticated animals, uh, etc. And then somewhere around 2000 or 2091 circa, Abraham comes along, is obedient to God and follows him, and so Judaism Following Abraham, Father Abraham, as we talked yesterday, sometime around the middle of the 15th century, by traditional dating, Moses comes along, is called by God to lead the Exodus out of Egypt to receive the law, which created the religion of Judaism, at Mount Sinai, and then starts the Jewish faith. After 40 years of wandering the desert because of being disobedient, most of the people did not believe that God uh, could help them, was sufficient to help them overcome the people who occupied Canaan, and so they wandered for 40 years until the whole generation of adult males had died out. That's why they wandered for 40 years. The only ones who still remained alive were the ones that had believed God, Joshua and Caleb. They enter into the Promised Land around 1406 BC. Then the next, uh, a lot of things happen. You have Joshua and his people conquering the land. Around 1010 BC, King David is anointed as the second king of Israel, the, the United Nation of Israel, the United Kingdom. Um, after Saul, the first king, was disobedient and God was, uh, you know, got rid of him. But King David became the great king, the second, or actually the third of the most critical characters in the Jewish faith. Abraham, Moses, David. Abraham started them as a people. Moses was the lawgiver through whom the faith, the religion of Judaism was given. And David made them into a nation, the nation of Israel. And then, 966 B.C., Solomon begins building the temple, and the temple becomes the focal point of Jewish faith from that point on. Then we have, about almost a thousand years later, around 6 or 4 B.C., we're not exactly sure, we have the birth of Jesus, a Jew, in Bethlehem, in the nation of Israel. Jesus the, the promise was given to the Jews all through their history that they would have a Messiah, one who would come of the line of David, who would be like a great king, like David had, to make them a great nation again, as they had been under David. Under David and Solomon, Israel was a significant nation. They had visitors from other parts of the world. They were wealthy. There were not other major powers in that time that they really had to be as afraid of. It was sort of a lull in between the uh, Hittites, the Egyptians, the Assyrians and Babylonians that came along later gave them problem, but they grew under David and Solomon because it was a time of relative peace in the region. Then the promise had always been given that a, an heir to David, of the line of David, would come that would make them a great nation again. The Jews had no idea, they did not have a conception that this would be anything more than a man, like David was a man, that he would be born of the line of David, become a ruler for them, Jesus comes along, he begins his ministry at about age 30, so we're looking at somewhere around 24 AD now, of course the dividing point. Um, and by the way, I, when you read things nowadays, you may see a difference. I'll give you a little sidebar here. The traditional way of, of defining before Jesus and after Jesus as the sort of center point of the Western timeline is uh, BC, before Christ, and AD, which doesn't mean after death, it means Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Well, there's a lot of scholarship that is not Christian in its orientation, and so it's very common nowadays to talk about BCE, which means before the Common Era, and CE, Common Era. So BCE is how the scholars, uh, scholarly people now refer to what we used to call BC, 
And CE, or Common Era, is what we typically historically have called um, AD, okay? Just so if you see BCE or CE and you wonder what that's all about, just translate it in your mind to BC or AD, if that's what you're used to, okay? So Jesus comes along, he spends three years in ministry, and he then is crucified, according to the Christian uh, beliefs, but he is resurrected and ascends into heaven. The difference between the Jewish expectation and beliefs and the Christian expectation is that the belief of the Christians is that Jesus not only was of the line of David and the great king returned, but that he actually was the son of God, that he was divine. This is something neither the Jews nor the, the Muslims can accept because both feel like this is creating more than one God. I'll talk about that in a minute when we get to it. And then the first three centuries of Christianity, they were persecuted first by the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem and then later by the Roman authorities sometimes more severely, sometimes less severely. Then in the early 300s, Constantine becomes emperor and he legalizes religion. He does not make religion the official, uh, people make this mistake, he doesn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That happens later under Theodosius. But Constantine himself professes faith. His mother is a Christian, St. Helen, the one who found the birthplace, the, the, the place of, of crucifixion, um, the, the, all the other stuff, including the burning bush and all of that, okay? So Constantine makes Christianity legal, a radical change. Then, about 300 years later, see I hadn't even changed the state from uh, previous time, about 300 years later, um, after Constantine, 350 years, we get the birth of Muhammad. Muhammad is born in the city of Mecca in what we know of as Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. When he is, a, and he's a, as a young man, he's known as being exceptionally honest. He works in trade, caravan routes. He ends up marrying a woman who had been his boss, who was uh, uh, quite a few years his senior, and is very faithful to her throughout her life. When he's about 40 years old, he had had a, he had had a tradition during the time of Ramadan, you know, the, the holy month, of going up into the hills and going into caves to pray and to seek you know, God's direction. And in one of those caves, when he was 40 years old, he received the first revelation of the Quran. We'll talk about. From that point on, he began to preach to his relatives. His wife is his first convert. Ali, who is his son-in-law and cousin, is one of his first male converts. And Ali's name is going to come up again. And then, in, but unfortunately, because he was saying, you need to get rid of all these multiple gods that you have, and you people need to live a moral life. God was telling him that living a moral life is critically important. Well, the people in Mecca didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to get rid of their gods. They didn't want to be told that they were you know, messing up. And so there was persecution in Mecca. Eventually, in 622, so this is um, 12 years after the initial revelation of the Quran, Muhammad and his followers head north to another city, the city of Yatrib, which became known later as Medina. Medina means the city, the city of the prophet. They go north. That date, 622, the date of the Hajira, or the, the exodus north for them from Mecca to Medina, is counted as the start of the Islamic faith. The Muslim calendar begins on what we consider 622 AD. And then in 632, after being responsible for converting most of the Arabian Peninsula, Muhammad dies after a short illness. He is succeeded by a number of caliphs. You've heard the word caliph. Caliph means literally successor. Those who, who take over following Muhammad, successors to Muhammad. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the, the introduction to Islam in the more detail. The first four caliphs were the most important ones. They were called the Rashidun, or rightly guided Caliphs, and that's the point at which Islam begins to get very complicated. You know, as I think I mentioned before, most people uh, in the West think that Islam is this monolithic belief system that's trying to take over the world. Islam is very complicated. It is very divided. There are many different factions that really don't get along. So we'll talk about that. So in 632, Muhammad's death, the Caliphs, the four Rashidun, rightly guided Caliphs, take over, and then there are a number of different uh, caliphates or dynasties of Islam that we'll talk about. So this is a general overview to give you a start of the three great monotheistic religions and how they, they see themselves as connected back to Abraham. 
Now, let's talk about them one at a time in chronological order. Let's talk first about Judaism. We'll start with saying, world population right now is considered to be about 7.3 million people. Christianity is the world's largest religion, or billion, excuse me. Uh, Christianity has about 2.2 billion adherents, or followers. Um, and I'm not differentiating between those who are serious about it and those who simply, you know, live in a country where Christianity is dominant. Still, we calculate it this way. The Muslim faith, which is the second largest and the fastest growing, is at 1.6 billion. Hindus worldwide, 1.1. Buddhists worldwide, 488. Sikhs worldwide, 28. These are the largest of the world religions. Now, to give you a perspective, in the country of Indonesia, which is the most populous Muslim country, it's not Saudi Arabia or Egypt or one of the countries in the Middle East, it's Indonesia, the island nation in the Pacific. Indonesia has 205 million Muslims. In the United States, there are 16 million Southern Baptists. Just Southern Baptists, they're the largest Protestant denomination. I give you those numbers to give you a perspective because worldwide, there's a total of only 14 million Jewish people now. Um, it's only been in the last couple of years that there are more Jewish people in the nation of Israel than outside Israel. It used, for a long, long time, there were more Jews in New York than there were in Israel. But the, the uh, right of return has meant a great many Jewish people, especially from um, Russia, former Soviet countries. There has been a, a great return of Jewish people back to uh, Israel since the 1940s. So now more than half of the Jewish people are there, but there's only 14 million, that's 0.2% of the world's population. These are the Abrahamic religions, as they're called, the monotheistic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. But lest you think that Judaism is insignificant in having only 14 million compared to 2.2 uh, billion, or 1.6 billion, as in the case of Christianity and Islam, the Jewish people, or Jews, have received more than 22% of all Nobel Prizes and are a major force, as I'm sure you're aware, in virtually every field you can imagine. In entertainment, medicine, law, on, on, on. Every field you can imagine, even though there are so few Jewish people relative to the global population, the Jewish people have continued to be a major force in any cultural aspect of civilization you care to, and that's still true today. Um, and so even though there are very few of them, the significance of the Jewish people cannot be made light of. Thank God for the Jewish people, okay? Um, now, the call to the Jews, I mentioned the call to Abraham. In Exodus, God said to Moses, and I'm quoting Exodus 19 here, although the whole earth is mine, God created the whole earth, he said to the Jewish people, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. This was the beginning of the law. So the Jewish faith, the Jewish belief, and the Christian belief as well, although it gets a little more complicated at that point, is that the Jewish people are the chosen people of God. That's where that expression, the chosen people, comes from. And they are the foundational faith from which Christianity, the world's largest religion, has sprung. Even though there are disagreements, you know, and the theologies uh, break down there. Now, the Jewish faith is based upon, primarily, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, as I mentioned to you when I did the, um, the uh, faith and culture in the ancient Near East. The Tanakh is a word, and it can be spelled a couple of different ways, that's actually an acronym. Judaism is fascinating because they take, they take phrases and push them together to create words. The Tanakh represents the three sections of the Jewish holy book. The Torah, the first five books, the books of Moses, um, the Nevi'im, which are the books of the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which are the writings. We think of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, those are all part of the writing books. Those three words, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, are put together to call the whole of the Hebrew Bible the Tanakh. Now, in addition to that, in addition to the written law, as it is called, and again, Torah can refer to the first five books of Moses or to the whole of the Hebrew Bible, and they talk about the law, and that's not just the law of Moses, like the Ten Commandments, and there actually are 613 different commandments in the Hebrew Bible. They are called the mitzvot, commandments. When a, when a boy reaches the age of 13 and he has a celebration in which he first reads of the, from the Torah in, in public, it is called a bar mitzvah. That literally means he is now a son of the commandment. 
and he has responsibility for obedience to the commandments and to be an adult in the community. So mitzvah or mitzvot for the plural are the commandments. In addition to the written law or Tanakh, the oral law um, had developed as commentary on the written um, Hebrew Bible for generations and generations and generations, and it was just oral. When we get into the second century AD, it had gotten so long and it had gotten so difficult, they decided we have to start writing this com these commentaries down now, and, the, and this is called the Talmud. In the second, end of the second century uh, AD, we end up with the first the Mishnah being written, it's the written version of the oral law, and then later commentary on the Mishnah was written called the Gemara. Mishnah and Gemara together form the Talmud, which you probably heard of, which is the commentary on the Jewish law. Now, the Talmud is two and a half million words. It is, you see why they needed to start writing it down, why it couldn't just be oral anymore. And so, um, but this too is an important part. It's, it's not equal to the Tanakh, but very, very important. Um, basic Jewish faiths. The fundamental Jewish faith is represented, uh, and I'm going to give you two ways that it's represented. First, it is in the Ten Commandments, which you, I'm sure, have heard. Um, first, you shall have no other gods before me. This great statement of monotheism, or some would say henotheism, because it doesn't say there are no other gods. It says you won't have any other gods before me. God is the one great God. Secondly, you shall not make or worship any idols. Third, you, which is why you don't have any images in Jewish synagogues. Right? Because you don't make you, no graven images, and, and rather than take any risk of that, there aren't any images in a standard synagogue. You shall uh, not take the Lord of your God in vain, and that, again, is why, as we said before, when reading the Hebrew Bible, when they come to the proper name of God, which God gave to Moses, which is Yahweh, I can pronounce it, I'm not Jewish, uh, they will either say Adonai, which means Lord, or they will say Hashem, which means the name. They'll sort of they'll they'll um, replace the proper name of God with one of those two expressions. Jehovah, did I tell you this? The word Jehovah, the word Jehovah does not exist. You've heard Jehovah. What happened is when they're teaching, especially boys, to read the Torah, when they come to Yahweh, they're not allowed to say Yahweh. They're told to say Adonai. Well, in the margins, as they were teaching people, there are no vowels in written Hebrew or any written ancient language. In fact, you can see right here, this is this is Hebrew. There's, there aren't breaks in the words. There are no vowels. It's all, all ancient written languages only had consonants. Well, when they're teaching boys how to read this, vowels are breathing sounds. A, A, E, O, U. Well, to know how to pronounce it, they would put points, dots, literally that represented different vowels in the margins, in order, so that when you came to a word, this would be the vowels that you need to insert there to pronounce it. Since they didn't say Yahweh, they said Adonai when they got to the proper name of God, Jehovah is the consonants from Yahweh and the vowel points from Adonai. There really isn't any such word. I don't have heartburn about that, but just an interesting fact. The rest of the Ten Commandments, um, Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, do no work on that day, honor your father and your mother. Now these first five are traditionally understood to be admonitions about our relationship with God. Now you wonder how honor your father and your mother has to do with our relationship with God. Well, because God gave us our father and mother as the authority figures in our life, and obedience to our parents in the Jewish faith was seen as being a, re a reflection of our obedience to God, since he gave us our parents. The next five of the Ten Commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness against your neighbor, means don't lie. Do not covet your neighbor's house or wife or manservant or maidservant or ox or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Those five have to do with our relationship with other people. So the first five, relationship with God. The second five of the Ten Commandments with our relationship to other people. The second five, our relationship with other people, is why Judaism is called an ethical monotheism. All three of the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, are all considered ethical monotheisms because they say how you act, your moral, the morality of your life is part of your faith. That was not cons true with most ancient religions prior to Judaism. Um, so ethical monotheism is a critical part of it. The Ten Commandments and then the total of 613 commandments or mitzvah in the Hebrew Bible are the law that was given. Now another way 
to understand basic Jewish beliefs are the 13 principles given by Maimonides, who sometimes called Rambam. Maimonides lived at the um, end of the 12th, early 13th century. He's considered one of the greatest scholars and teachers and philosophers and physicians in not only in Judaism, but in history. He came up with 13 principles that he believed reflected the truth of the Jewish faith and what Judaism was. Those are, number one, God exists and he is a creator. Number two, God is one and unique. There is none other like him. A reflection of the Jewish faith is often seen in what's called the Shema, um, which says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which is, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And it continues in Deuteronomy to say, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and, uh, heart and soul and strength. There's two versions of it in the New Testament, so I twist it sometimes. Um, this is, you've seen Jewish people with tefillin, these boxes, they have a box on their head and they wrap it around. Well, the admonition in, in the Tanakh to keep the word of God on your mind and to keep it close to your heart, those boxes, which they wear on the tefillin, have the Shema, Dear O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one, written, and so it's to be kept on their mind and kept close to their heart, which is why it's wrapped around their arms, so the box is right here. Um, Maimonides continued, God is not physical, he is spirit, God is eternal. Prayer is to be directed only to God. The words of the prophets are true. The prophecies of Moses are true. The Torah, the law, was given to Moses. There is no other Torah, which is why the difficulty uh, in Judaism of accepting either the New Testament of Christians or other uh, writings. God knows the thoughts and deeds of all. God rewards the good and punishes the wicked. The Messiah will come. There's the Jewish expectation for a Messiah and the dead will be resurrected. The Jewish faith too has an idea of an eternal life and resurrection of the dead. And Maimonides is seen, his 13 principles are seen as a reflection of what Judaism is by many. Now, there are differences. But when you look at the 10 commandments and the 13 principles of Maimonides, you get a very good sense of what Judaism is, what the belief of Judaism is all about. Now, there is not one Judaism there are a number of different uh, sect, sections, you know, denominations of Judaism, like there are most religions. That's true of Christianity, that's true of Islam. Orthodox Judaism is the most conservative. There are about 7% of all American Jews are Orthodox. They hold to a very strict understanding of the Torah as the law of God and obedience to the Torah. You then have, on the other end of the spectrum, Reform Judaism, which is the most liberal. Um, it's um, it believes that the demand to use um, our minds to take into account the modernity of society means that you diminish the emphasis on the legal structure of Judaism. In response to those two, we then, de then develop conservative Judaism, which is a middle path between the very conservative orthodoxy and the much more liberal reform. They conserve the traditional elements, but they allow for a modernization to some degree. You have Reconstructionist Judaism, which is like reform. Um, it's less legalistic, less fundamental than orthodoxy, but with a special emphasis on community. You have the Jewish renewal movement, which focuses on spirituality and social concern rather than the law. You have humanistic Judaism, which is not theistic. They have no focus on God at all, but they focus on the Jewish tradition and Jewish community. And then I, I could mention the uh, Hasidic Judaism, Hasidic Judaism uh, as well, Hasidim, which started in the 12th century, uh, first in Germany, later in Poland, which is, they are the pious ones. They believe it's a, it's a fairly mystical, ascetic version. You've heard of the Hasidim, uh, Hasidic Jews. And then you have the Kabbalah, popularized by Madonna and others, you know, the colored strings they wear around their wrists. This is a very <coughs> mystical kind of version. Um, it focuses on a special understanding of the transcendence and the eminence of God. There's a lot of, it gets into numerology and a lot of other, I mentioned the Gematria uh, when I was talking about the 6,000 people who left in the Exodus, uh, Jewish people. Well, they get a lot into numerology and those sorts of Gematria and, and things. So Judaism is very diverse. There's a lot of different understanding of Judaism. Um, in 70 AD, there have been a couple of different diasporas or spreading out of Jewish people. The primary one happened in 70 AD when the Romans came in, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and the Jewish people fled. Now, they fled everywhere 
throughout Europe, North Africa, to the east. This is why you find Jewish people everywhere. And then later on, of course, um, with the discovery of the New World, Jewish people uh, immigrated to the New World as well. You, you end up with two sort of basic groups of Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews who were in Germany, Poland, and Russia, and the Sephardic Jews who were in uh, first in Spain. They then got thrown out of Spain in the 15th century after the Muslims were driven out of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. One of the very first things that the monarchs, Christian monarchs did, was throw all the Jews out of the Iberian Peninsula as well. So they traveled to North Africa and other places. But this is why the persecution of the Jewish people is one of the reasons you have Jews everywhere. Um, Mark Twain famously said, all things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but the Jew remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Well, the book of Jeremiah says, Jacob will again have peace and security. Jacob, Israel, is a representation, a symbol of the Jewish people. And no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations around which I, among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. The promise in the Hebrew Bible is that the Jews will remain. And contrary to, they are the most persecuted people in the history of the world, all the way down to the 20th century, with the persecution not only of Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust, but of Joseph Stalin in Russia as well. And yet, the Jews remain. Um, that's why we only have 14 million. But um, So this is Judaism. Very quick introduction. My apologies to any Jewish people in the audience for doing such short shrift. Let's talk for a couple of minutes about the two successors or the two subsequent religions that came out of Judaism. First, Christianity. As I said, there was always a Jewish expectation of a Messiah, but they thought the Messiah would be a human leader. When Jesus came to earth around 6 BC, 4 BC, he declared himself, and if somebody tells you Jesus never said he was divine, he was. I'll talk to me about that later if you want to. Jesus accepted recognition by those who followed him that he was the very Son of God. Um, he lived for 33 years on the earth, is our understanding, and that story is given to us in the New Testament, it's called. The Christian Bible is of two parts, as I'm sure you probably know. The, what, what Christians call the Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible, and it's all the same. Now, it's broken up differently, and it's in a different order. For instance, the Jewish, the Jewish Bible has one book of Chronicles, one book of Samuel, one book of Kings. Christianity broke it up into 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, primarily because the longer books, it was hard to put them on one scroll, so they broke them up. The Hebrew Bible has one book of the Minor Prophets, or the Book of the Twelve, it's called. Christian, the Christian Bible, the Old Testament, breaks it up into 12 different books, the Minor Prophets. And then we have the New Testament, which is the story of Jesus, and the story of the growth of the church and instruction to the church following that. So um, the Hebrew Bible is considered part of the Holy Bible of the Christians as well. The basic beliefs of Christianity, I'm going to spend less time on Christianity because I think most of you come from that tradition, and then I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Islam either because we're going to deal with that in two days. The first belief of Christianity is that there is only one God. He reveals himself in three persons, the Holy Trinity. The Father, Son, who is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. A unity sharing in one substance. Now, how's, what's that all about? Jews and Muslims both say Christians have three different gods. A lot of different analogies have been attempted to explain how God can be one God with three persons. Um, one of the better analogies is an egg. There is one egg, but it has three distinct parts. There's a shell, there's a yolk, and there's a white. Right? All of them have different purposes, but they make up one egg. To me, the analogy I use when I teach about the Trinity is a person. You know, I'm one person, I'm one being, but I have a controlling mind, the cognitive part of me. I have a spirit, which is the part of me that 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 receives and deals with non-cognitive things: love, loyalty, honor, trust. Those aren't cognitive values, but yet there's a part of me that responds to that. And I have a physical body. It is possible for my mind to be gone and my body to survive for a time after that, or for my body to no longer work, but for my mind to still be alive. So there is a separation there, and yet they make me one person. This is the Christian concept, I believe, one way to understand the Christian concept of the Trinity, and yet we are monotheists. We believe in one God. Belief of Christians is that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent, all present in all places at once. These are the omnis. Okay? 
He created the world as distinct from himself. Pantheism, like some of the uh, some of the Asian religions, say that all things that are are part of God. Judaism and Christianity and Islam, none of them say that. They say that God created the world as separate from himself. So it's not pantheistic. He created the world distinct from himself, but is active within it as creator, as sustainer, and as sanctifier, meaning to make it holy. The belief of Christianity is that Jesus was and is the promised Messiah of the Jewish people, and there is, um, there is a Messianic Jewish movement, which, again, Orthodox Jews have a lot of trouble with, but a recent study was done that there's a significant change over the last 50 years amongst Jewish people. One third of Jewish people now believe you can be Jewish and also believe in Jesus as the Messiah that the Jews have been expecting. That used to not be the case at all. Um, and yet that is more common. Jesus is seen as the promised Messiah, the co-eternal divine son of God, means he's always existed, who became a human man, Jesus, but still was fully God and fully man. Not 50-50, not 80-20. The Jewish belief is that he was fully God and fully man. This is a mystery. Okay? And the idea of Christianity is that no one can earn God's mercy or become truly righteous on their own, but they can only receive forgiveness and mercy by accepting Jesus as God's Son who sacrificed himself on the cross to atone for human sins. Christianity is entirely oriented around the, what we believe about Jesus as being the Son of God. That's... You know, if you wonder where somebody falls in terms of their Christianity, what do they believe about Jesus? Now, by A.D. 70, which is only about 40 years after the death of Jesus, Christianity had grown, significantly due to the efforts of Paul, the Apostle Paul and others, not only throughout Israel, Canaan, the Holy Land, but up into what was then called Asia Minor, this is what we call Turkey, over into Greece, to Rome, the islands of the Mediterranean, Cyprus and Crete, um, and then also um, the North Africa, Cyrene, Egypt, around Alexandria. This is within about 40 years. Without email, without airplanes, without you know modern transportation, the word spread very quickly. And remember, this was during a time when it was under persecution. By the 500s, Christianity had spread throughout. The, the green line is the Roman Empire in 565. The yellow areas, all of the all of the uh, Huns, the Visigoths, the Astrogoths, the Franks, the, all of the the pagan people that had uh, in, the, in the 400s had destroyed Rome, etc. Most of them had converted to Christianity over the next century and a half after the, the destruction of Rome, or the conquering of Rome, I guess I should say. It was never fully destroyed, and so you have Christianity existing all the way up into Germany, France, as we know it, all of the Iberian Peninsula, all of North Africa, the yellow areas, Egypt all along the eastern Mediterranean. So Christianity, by the mid-500s, extended beyond the Roman Empire, okay? And I tell you that, I give you that for a specific reason, because remember sort of that, that area when we talk about Islam. Like Judaism, there are a lot of different types of Christianity. Roman Catholicism, and when I talked about Catholicism, somebody came up and mentioned to me that there's a Western Catholicism that, that has married priests, etc. Yes, there are a lot of smaller you know, when we talk about the large divisions, there are smaller uh, pieces or versions of Christianity as well, but uh, for the sake of the time we have, we can only talk about the big ones. Roman Catholicism the, uh, in started in Rome, Western Europe. Orthodoxy in the 11th century, there was the Great Schism in which Eastern Christianity, which spoke Greek and had a different rite, and Western Christianity, which spoke Latin, divided. Uh, wild story. And then Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy, other versions of Orthodoxy, then split up within the Eastern or Greek version of the Church. In the 16th century, we have the Protestant Reformation, starting with Martin Luther and Zwingli in Switzerland, later on John Calvin. They um, started out trying to correct the Catholic Church, what they believed were, were errors. That correction was not well received, and so they ended up splitting off, and that's where Protestantism came from. The four major areas of Protestantism right now are Lutheran, Reformed, which are the Presbyterians, um, Anglican, and Anabaptist. Now, Anglican, others, like if you're Baptist, then you came out of actually not the Anabaptist, but the Anglican stream. Methodism came out of the Anglican stream. There, are, So a lot of, all of the denominations that you may be aware of came out of all of that. So this is Christianity. Let's talk about Islam for a few minutes, briefly, so that we can spend more time on it in two days. 
As I said before, in 570, the Prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca when he was about 40, right at 40 years old. He received the first of the revelations in a cave above Mecca, which was to be the Quran. Now, Muhammad himself was illiterate. He did not write this down. In fact, as he told it, the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, we use the name Gabriel, it's Gibriel to, uh, to Islam, appeared to him and said, recite. And he said, I can't recite, I don't read. And, and Gabriel said, recite, he kept ordering him to, and then finally he started rem you know, hearing and remembering what the angel Gabriel told him. Later on, he taught that, recited it to his followers, and they later wrote it down. Um, he lived until he was right at 62 years old. Um, during his lifetime, during Muhammad's lifetime, this orange area here on the, um, the Arabian Peninsula are the areas, and a little bit over here in, in Oman, is what was converted to Islam. After his death, one of the first things that happened is a lot of the people that had converted to Islam changed their mind again, and so his first successor, Abu Bakr, who we'll talk about, his first job was to settle all those people down and to reaffirm uh, Islam. Under the next four Rashidun, or rightly guided caliphs, all of this other lighter orange area here came under the influence of Islam. And then, later on, under the next dynasty of the caliphs, the Umayyad, they took over the rest of North Africa and all the way up into the Iberian Peninsula to Spain, Portugal, and made ventures, military ventures, up all the way into France to Tours. In fact, the Emperor Charlemagne that you've heard of in the 800s, his father, Charles Martel, is the one that was really as responsible as anyone else for stopping the advance of Islam in that part of the world. You'll notice that at this point, uh, this says the, the growth of Islam, they got up into part of the um, Asia Minor, which we know of as Turkey. Later on, this, this chart says this is the Arab Empire, the Islamic Arab Empire, at its great, the greatest extent. You'll notice it does go up right to the border of Spain and France. Now the Byzantine, the remains of the Roman Empire, is this lighter color here. Later on, the Muslims were driven out of the Iberian Peninsula, but at the same time, they took over all of Asia Minor, all of Eastern Europe, all the way up to, um, to the gates of Vienna for a very long time. They had several major battles to try to take over Vienna, Austria, and were there for a long, long time. So that was the growth of Islam. Now, Muslim life is, um, Islam is quite different in one way from Christianity and um, Judaism in that there's much more of an emphasis. Well, this is true to a great extent with both of the other religions as well, but more so in Islam. Muslim life is more about orthopraxy, which means right action, than it is about orthodoxy, which means right belief. The issue is how do you live your life? Um, it's based upon the writings of the Quran, the holy book which was given through Muhammad, as they understand it, and upon the Sunnah, which is the life example of Muhammad and also his companions, but especially how Muhammad lived his life as the perfect example, and the Hadith, the sayings of Muhammad and his companions. And there's a whole science of Hadith to figure out in Islam what are the most reliable ones, which are the ones that are most, you know, uh, most significant in terms of being obedient to. Now, the revelation to Muhammad was given in Arabic, and the Muslim peoples believe that Arabic is the very language of God. And so, therefore, the Quran has to be read, studied, and memorized in Arabic to truly be proper. If you don't read it in Arabic, if you translate it to another language, they don't consider that a legitimate Quran. They consider it a commentary on the Quran. Because the true Quran has to be in Arabic. Because they believe that the Quran has always existed in heaven, in God's mind, and he gave it to us in that form. The word Islam means submission, meaning submission to Allah and to his will. A Muslim is a version of the same root word, which means one who does submit, one who submits to Allah. There are five pillars to the, to the Islamic faith. First, the profession of faith, the Shahada. And by the way, one of the difficulties you run into when you get into reading this stuff is there's no standard way to transliterate Arabic letters into English letters or any other set of letters. You will see words spelled many different ways. Quran can be spelled as I do, Q-U-R apostrophe A-N, or just Q-U-R-A-N, or K-O-R-A-N, etc. So you'll see different spellings for Shahada, sometimes an H on the end, etc. The Shahada is the statement of faith, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. 
when we talk, I'll get into that a little bit more, but this, all it's required to be a Muslim is to be able to pronounce this correctly in the Arabic in the presence of two other Muslims, and you're a member. I mean, you, you become Islamic at that point. Um, if you mean it, if you say it with faith, that is. The second of the principles or pillars is the principle of salah or prayer. You heard the calls to prayer as we were traveling five times a day. There are other, t other kinds of prayer that you can do as well. And then on Friday, midday at the mosque is the most important time of prayer. Third is generous almsgiving or zakat, which uh, a Muslim is expected to give 2.5% of their um, material belongings each year, not just your income. It's not, a, it's not a tax. It's not a percentage of your income. It's what you have. This is supposed to both care for those who are in need and also to sort of level the field so that there is not an inequity between the wealthy and the poor. Now, one of the interesting things in Islam, because most people in the West think of it as being very rigid, in almost every case there are acceptable exceptions. If you are not financially able to give 2.5%, then you are released from that or you're allowed to give less. If you have reasons why you can't pray at a given time, somebody asked when we were on the Falukas and we heard the call to prayer, well, these guys aren't praying. You know, what's going on? Well, we didn't know for sure they were Muslims. But if you find yourself in a situation where you can't pray right then, you can do it later. You can, you can make up for it. Um, and so, uh, or if you're not well, if you are, if you are ill. The fourth is fasting, or psalm, which is done during the month of Ramadan, the holy month of, the, of Islam. Um, you fast from day, daybreak to sunset. You don't eat or drink. It's also a time where they don't curse. They don't, you know, during that time, they don't, you know, have um, sexual relations with their spouse. There are all sorts of things you're not supposed to do. It's a time to focus on God. Now, because the Islamic calendar is 11 days different than our Western calendar, Ramadan comes at, you know, a different time every year, uh, the month of Ramadan. And so over a period of time, it will be in the heat of summer or in the cold of winter or whatever. You know, So it, it's very different um, in terms of their practice. And fifthly, the, the pilgrimage to Mecca or the Hajj, as it's called, at least once in a person's life, they are expected to make the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca to participate in the rites, the rituals at Mecca. Um, this is what that looks like. This is the Kaaba, which we'll explain later what the Kaaba is all about. This is in the main mosque um, in Mecca. Every year, the gathering in Mecca, in the last few years, has been between two and three million people. It is the largest gathering of humanity anywhere in the world. Now, you have to be Muslim to participate in this. We'll talk about some of that rite, the ritual that goes on there. So, of the Abrahamic religions, what are the similarities and the differences? All three of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, believe there is one true God. They are monotheistic. Now, again, Jews and Muslims don't believe that Christians have that right, because they think we actually worship three gods. Interestingly, in the Quran, they talk about the Trinity in the Quran in several places as being God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and, or Issa, as they call him, because they, Islam believes that Jesus is a prophet, but not divine. And the third person of the Trinity is God the Mother, Mary. So very different than the Christian understanding of that. They don't have a sense of the Holy Spirit in the way we do. Um, the second common belief is that all life, especially all people, are made by God, who is the creator and s sustainer of life. God created, he sustains. And social justice and concern for others are, is critical. This is the ethical monotheism part of it. That you, ethics, how you live your life, your morality is important. These are the ways primarily that they agree. They differ first in terms of the exact nature of God. Christianity differs because they see God as a trinity. Islam believes that the God of Judaism and the God of Christianity, God the Father, are the same as Allah, but that Jews and Christians have gotten it wrong. Now, Judaism and Christianity don't necessarily agree with that, that Allah is the same as, you know, as Yahweh or God the Father. But, um, so they differ some on the exact nature of God, even though they're all three monotheistic. Uh, secondly, the nature of the human condition. The idea of um, Islam has no sense of original sin, which Christians have this idea that all people are born, because of the sin of Adam, with um, inherent sin that has to be dealt with. Islam does not see it that way. Um, third, the nature of the afterlife, or salvation. 
the Jewish belief of um, salvation involves return from exile. All three do have a sense of an afterlife, that the dead will be resurrected, but they have a different idea of what it's going to be like. For instance, in the Islamic faith, any non-Muslim goes to hell. They have a concept of hell and heaven. They go to hell forever. Muslims who have not lived a good Muslim life will go to hell for a little while, but ultimately will be let out and let into paradise. So there's a different view there. And finally, the requirements for pleasing and satisfying God. In Christianity, it is much more of a faith issue that is an orthodoxy, a right belief, than it is action, although you're expected to live a moral life. Judaism has a little of both, but you know the, the right belief and, and obedience to the law, but it's much more how you live your life in Islam. Than, uh, the orthopraxy, right action rather than right belief. So those are some of the differences. Any questions? Uh, thank you for listening. Any questions about all of that? I know it's a lot, but it gives you kind of a summary. Yes? It's a rather complicated question. Um, if the Islamic uh, faith is based on the Jewish faith, Right. Why doesn't the more traditional rally against that? The question is if Islam is predominantly a religion of peace, of acceptance, then why when there are radical elements, why have the others not rallied against them? Actually they have. Every Islamic um, religious leader, the Grand Muftis of Egypt and of Sudan, Every, every uh, predominantly Islamic country has, for instance, spoken out in condemnation against ISIL. And I'll mention a little bit about ISIL when we, at the end when we talk about Islam. Um, there have been Islamic, um, Islamic radical efforts, what we call Islamism, which means a politicizing of Islam is basically what it means. ISIL being the most recent example of that. Um, we have to remember that there have also been radical, militant aspects to the other religions. Christianity has had its time. You remember I just told you they threw all of the Jews out of, out of Spain. Um, some of the actions at various times of the Christian faith. I mean, Jim Jones and the People's Temple and, you know, hundreds of people committing suicide and on and on. I mean, we can find examples, extreme examples of that in, in almost all of the religions. That's not to say it's okay, it's just that we need to make sure that we have a balance on that. The fact is, uh, and people say, well, the, the Quran calls for all infidels, all non-Muslims to be killed. There are 109, I'm getting into details here, now we'll talk about it later. There are 109 verses in the Quran that are called the sword verses. And they do say that you witness, and if they will not, you know, if they continue to oppose you, then you, you fight back. Almost all of those sword verses were written very early on during the time when there was there was severe persecution. I mean, I'm talking about killing them uh, against the the followers of Muhammad from the, the people who were in authority in Mecca. And so it was very it was it was much more of a self defense kind of thing. Now the problem is most of Sharia, which is the law, the Islamic law, the, is taken not directly from the Quran but from the Hadith which is the commentary on the law. And the commentaries on the law differ radically between Sunna, Sunni and, and Shia uh, groups, between different schools within those. Some of the interpretations have been much more aggressive, much more militant, much more radical. And so the groups that follow those more radical interpretations justify their actions from that. The vast majority, I mean, you were just in two Islamic countries. And I don't think you had any sense that the people were getting ready to, you know, gather around and stone you or anything like that. The vast majority of Islamic people in Islamic countries are not aggressive. There are factions, but Christians and Jews have had those factions as well. Even the Jewish people in the first century, the Zealots, were Jews who believed that they needed to take military action, violent action, subversive action to get rid of the Romans, you know, so even the Jewish people, which have probably less of that, they've had that as well. So we need to be very careful. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get along, okay? Yes? There's a common thread here between these religions that Moses gets the Ten Commandments, uh, Gabriel gets the word of uh, Muhammad, uh, even Mormonism, where uh, the angel of Moroni comes down and translates the Golden Palace. Right. Right. 
Well, what, he's, what he said was, if I heard you correctly, all these different religions that have writings that claim they were given by God, and that includes not only Judaism, Christianity, Islam, but Mormon, the Mormon Church, etc., they all have writings that they claim were given by God, and yet we don't have any of the original documents because most of them are very, very old. I mean, that's that's the fact. They, when we talked about the Codex Sinaiticus at Mount Sinai at uh, St. Catharines, the issue of what, what are the oldest documents we can find, the ones closest to the original source, that's always a goal. But we don't have the original documents. Mostly, we don't have them because um, the materials that those things were, were written on were, were you know, very much fragile. You know, they, they decayed, they went away. Uh, parchment or uh, papyrus or whatever. Um, th the fact is that the religions that have lasted are the ones that have writing. You know, if you, if you want to start a religion and have it last, write something down. The ones that did not, do not have written records do not, uh, are not established, they do not grow. That's not to say that those who are established and have written records, that there's something wrong with them, because it, that makes sense that they would have a written declaration of what their faith is about and what their history is. So, uh, Emily first, and then back here. Uh, but isn't the question really about the bees, what the bees have in common is they are um, religions that are, that are revealed? That's correct. Um, it's, it's, important it's a very good point, when, uh, and thank you for, for making that point. The idea of revelation. Remember when I talked, my first talk, which was about faith and culture in the ancient Near East, I said that the earlier or more primitive religions were much more about observing the natural world and trying to come up with some way to explain it or understand it or potentially even to control it, you know, by writing or by, you know, by naming. Um, the monotheistic religions all start with God calling Abraham and revealing himself, at least both verbally, to Abraham. And so all three of the monotheistic religions and subsequent religions to that, some of them, see themselves as re uh, religions of revelation, where God spoke and said, this is what I want you to know. This is who I am, this is who you are, this is how we're supposed to relate to one another. And so, and those are the ones that have a written record of that because they, they recorded various in various ways the revelation they received. So you're exactly right. The idea of the monotheistic religions and some of the more recent, more modern religions are revealed rather than religions determined from observation of the natural world. Yes? Right. Right. Correct. Right. The the original law was carved on stone. The original Ten Commandments was carved on stone. Now, the first set of it, Moses broke in anger when he came down and, and saw them worshiping the golden calf, which I believe was probably Hathor. But, um, and he went back up and God gave him another set. Traditionally, those tablets were put in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was carried with the Hebrew people, but when the, the, at the destruction of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant was lost, which is why we don't have those tablets anymore. And there are a couple of different locations in the world where they believe the Ark of the Covenant is resident. One of them is in Ethiopia. And no one is allowed in, no one's allowed to see it. You guys saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. Maybe it's in a warehouse in Washington, D.C. somewhere. I mean, we don't know. Um, but the idea is, yes, it was carved on stone and the idea of permanence, but those stones were put in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Covenant, the uh, Ark, has been lost. So that's why we don't have those. Who knows? Someday we may find it. Now, in fact, that was a point I meant to make yesterday when we were talking about... Um, the relationship of archaeology and uh, archaeology and written records, and no criticism there. Archaeology is much newer. Early on, and they're still finding new stuff all the time. I mean, you saw they've got digs; they're coming up with new stuff. An example of the fact that archaeology is giving us a much greater understanding of the world. You've heard of the Hittites, the Hittite culture, which began in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey, and then was a major power starting in about 1600 BC and for quite a long time. And you know, fought against the Babylonians and all sorts of things. Um, the Hittites are recorded in the Bible. They're in the Egyptian records. They were in some of the other records of the ancient civilizations, but they had no archaeological evidence. And a lot of scholars said, we don't think there really was people in the Hittites. It wasn't until the end of the 1800s, toward the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, they started finding artifacts. And now they have a mountain of physical archaeological evidence about the Hittites. We know all about them. We know all about the... The, um, the fact that they introduced the um, chariots, um, the battles that they fought against various peoples, 
we have enormous, we have reliefs, we have sculptures, we have all kinds of stuff, but until about 130 years ago, they, we, people were saying they don't think, think they ever existed. So we're still finding stuff, and we may find more stuff that tells us about some of the things that, that we have just, just have record of in writing. Yes? Well, the idea there there are historical figures like Pontius Pilate was not known to be an actual historical figure, and later on they found record that he really was the Roman governor during this period of time in the first century. So we're finding new stuff all the time. As I say, the, the wonderful challenge, the great challenge, is we have ancient written records. We have archaeological evidence from times, and we're finding more all the time. To take these two things and understand how to blend them together, and there's always an act of interpretation. You know, some, an archaeologist who has a, an inclination to believe that the ancient written records are accurate may interpret things differently than someone who is an archaeologist who does not have as much regard for the ancient written records. So interpretation is critical, and we and that grows and varies over time. So, one last question, anybody? Yes. Could you help us understand the differences in the nature of the human condition from the Islamic perspective and the Christian uh, perspective? Like, you know, we have, I think a lot of us are very clear about original sin from a Christian perspective. Okay. But from the Islamic perspective, I think many of us wonder. We, we, we feel like we don't really understand. Islamic beliefs, and um, love to understand what Well, in two days, I'm going to do a whole talk just about Islam, okay. and we'll get into that. When I said that Christianity has a sense that all human beings are broken, and it's interesting that there has there has never been a, a, a major culture of any kind, human culture, that did not have some belief in the supernatural, whether it be God or angels or demons or whatever, magic, something beyond the physical realm. It's also true that virtually every culture we know anything about has had some kind of idea that there's something wrong with us, that people are broken in some way, and that we need the intercession of the gods, or that we need priests to, you know, to offer sacrifice in order to assist us, or whatever. Now, is uh, Christianity have a very clearly articulated idea of original sin that people are, you know, where it comes from and, and how you deal with it in the person of Christ and all that. Islam is, does not have a sense that the, Islam believes that all children are born pure. And in fact, one of the things that they do in Islam is the first thing that a baby is supposed to hear is the Shahada. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet. They whisper it in the ear of a newborn baby so that the first thing they hear, ideally, is the declaration of the unity of Allah and of Muhammad as his prophet. And then they continue from there. But the, they don't have a sense that people are, it's, it's how you act as you get older that sort of, you, you either build up on the positive column or the negative column, okay? And then and then, and they, you're judged after that. But again, you're judged and if you're found inadequate, you remember the wonderful uh, Egyptian images where they weigh your heart against the feather and depends upon whether your heart is heavy or light, you know, the judgment uh, that occurs. A very similar thing, not with that, necessarily that imagery, but that in Islam you are evaluated and um, but the, the determination, if you're a righteous Muslim, you, you enter into paradise. If you are, have been unrighteous in your life, but you are a believer, you may spend some time in hell, but then you will be released later. So we'll, we'll talk about that in Islam. Thank you all very much for your time. Appreciate it.